Today, inequality rules, great for some, horrid for most. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics, where well, I'm his posts covering finance and property news. Well, there is a three-way split across the country as inequality rises, with mortgage holders and renters bearing the brunt of poor policy decisions from recent years, while older property-owning cohorts are doing just fine. I've been highlighting the growing gulf between households and now the Australian Productivity Commission has released their research paper, A Snapshot of Inequality in Australia, which explores how the distributions of wealth and incomes have changed over the COVID-19 period and beyond to assess the state of economic inequality in Australia. They show that Australian wealth is overwhelmingly tied up in residential property, followed by superannuation. Property, owner occupied and other, comprises the majority of wealth for middle and high income Australians. That's around the top 60% of households. And they also show that households in the two oldest age groups, the 55 to 64 and 65 plus, hold the most wealth. And wealth has grown strongest for older Australians aged 65 plus. Their wealth grew at a compound rate of around 4% in the 20 years to 2022-23. That's roughly double the rate of younger households. This largely reflects older Australians' higher home ownership rates. It's true even though government payments and transfers to the older cohorts are greater than any other cohort, the vast majority of payments and transfers over 65 are from age-related payments, in particular the age pension. And finally, women are more exposed to inequality. The gender pay gap in Australia, based on full-time salaries, is around 12% in February 2024. And this goes up to around 22% once other sources of income are accounted for. Once taxes and government transfers are taken into account, the average disposal income for women over the age of 15 in Australia is around $49,000 in 2022 compared to $62,000 for men. And there are many other signals of inequality too, which can be seen, for example, in spending patterns. Data from ComBank IQ shows that the cost of living crisis and higher interest rates have had a disproportionate impact on Australian spending habits based on their generation. Australians aged over 60 increased their spending by more than the CPI inflation in the year to March 2024, whereas Australians aged under 60 increased their spending by less than inflation over the same period. And in fact, Australians aged between 25 and 34 outright cut their spending over the year. The increase in spending over the year more or less corresponds with age, with older households increasing their spending the most and younger households increasing their spending the least. Older Australians increased their spending by more than inflation across discretionary and non-discretionary areas, whereas younger Australians cut back in both areas. People aged 65 plus increased their spending across all categories except charities in the March quarter. In contrast, people in the 25 to 29 year age group reduced their overall spending by 3.5% year over year. This includes essential goods and services such as groceries, insurance and utilities. And many of those older cohorts are not impacted by rising mortgage rates or rents because they own their homes outright. And many of those households are also benefiting from increased investment returns. Actually, that accounts for about one third or one in three households. But there is a second cohort, the renters, who are experiencing massive rent rises. One reason why we've seen rental stress going through the roof in our surveys, with three quarters of those renting in cash flow stress. And the remaining one third of households are those burdened with mortgages, where stress is also registering as strongly as I've ever seen it. Given the variable rates here in Australia, around 80% of borrowers are on, Australians have seen one of the most significant hikes in mortgage rates in the world. No surprise then that debt servicing ratios have gone through the roof too, which may help to explain why the RBA has left the cash rate lower than many other countries, including New Zealand. And yet, the change in debt servicing ratios is way more extreme in Australia. As a result, this extreme concentration of variable mortgages has resulted in Australian mortgage repayments rising far quicker than pretty much anywhere else, despite the RBA keeping 
the official interest rates lower than elsewhere. The impact, of course, is profound, as I've been saying in my stress surveys, and this is also underscored by the latest from Roy Morgan, who, by the way, measures stress in a rather different way, but they estimate that nearly 1.6 million mortgage holders, which is 30.8%, were at risk of mortgage stress in the three months to April 2024. And in the two years since the RBA commenced the interest rate tightening cycle, the number of mortgage holders at risk of mortgage stress has increased by 753,000, according to Roy Morgan. The number of Australians at risk of mortgage stress has increased by 753,000 since May 2022, when the RBA began a cycle of interest rate increases, where Morgan noted official interest rates are now at 4.35%, the highest that interest rates have been since December 2011, over a decade ago. And the number of mortgage holders considered extremely at risk is now numbered at 994,000, or 20.2% of mortgage holders, which is significantly above the long-term average over the last 10 years of 14.4%, Roy Morgan said. And while mortgage stress levels are currently running below the GFC peak, they have increased considerably over the past two years amid the RBA's aggressive rate hikes. Australian mortgage holders have also been hit far harder than residents in other nations. This partially explains why Australians experienced the sharpest decline in household disposable income last year. Now, the Productivity Commission argues that inequality is not all bad, as it may be a result of entrepreneurial activity, but there are also many downsides. If it gets too out of kilter, and in my view, Australia has now become too unequal, risking poorer economic outcomes and social unrest. Most policymakers, by the way, are in the more affluent segments, so find it hard sometimes to recognise the true negative impacts seen across the country more broadly. The Commission says that income equality in Australia subsequently increased as the economy recovered post-COVID. Government support was phased out and the incomes of low-income households fell. Business income and activity rose, benefiting people towards the top of the income distribution who owned businesses. They say that we care about inequality because income and wealth and the ability to use those for consumption can be significant contributors to an individual's well-being and because inequality can be detrimental to the ongoing advancement of our economy and society. The potential consequences of high economic inequality include negative economic impacts, for example, on growth and productivity, and detrimental social outcomes like health outcomes and social cohesion. But some economic inequality may reflect well-being enhancing activities such as rewards for people's efforts or choices that support individual well-being in other ways. Beyond perceptions of equality, which do matter, by the way, the overall well-being of society can suffer when inequality is high. This is because inequality can lead to uneven access to social opportunities and services such as health and education, waste human capital potential, and increase vulnerabilities to economic shocks and the resources needed to recover from these, and can also reduce social justice and adversely perpetuate narrowly focused institutional arrangements and decision-making processes, they say. And there are direct economic consequences for the economy, as reports show that high income inequality is in fact correlated with lower economic growth, at least at current levels of inequality, according to the OECD. The gap between low income households and the rest of the population appears to be particularly detrimental to growth. A recent analysis also suggests that lower inequality is correlated with faster and more durable growth. A possible consequence of increasing inequality is also that it could harm social cohesion. And this could happen when different economic interests lead to social and political conflict. Although this aspect is subjective and hard to quantify, some research suggests that countries with more inequality also have more corruption and political instability. Does that sound familiar? Economic inequality also determines the opportunities for the next generation. That is, the more unequal a society is, the more likely it is that children will have the same economic situation as their parents. Intergeneral inequality and mobility are linked. Now, these are all important and uncomfortable concepts which boil back to a question. What type of society do we want? Well, I for one do not think that the current settings are right and social cohesion is actually coming unglued. Truth is that bad policy leads to bad society, as we are seeing right now. Unfortunately, though, currently, politicians 
want us to look elsewhere and misdirect us from these critical long-term structural issues. So well done for the Productive Commission for raising the issue, but the question is, will anything change? I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.